Donald Trump last week sort of rolling out his executive order Mm -hmm. on religious liberty. He had a couple of uh, comments. First of all, he talks about the financial threat against the religious community. This financial threat against the faith community is over. I want to dig into that comment, but first, let's hear the, let's hear the second one because he talked about the the choice that Americans have to make. No American should be forced to choose between the dictates of the federal government and the tenets of their faith. Okay, let's start with the first clip: the financial threat against the religious community. What kind of financial threat has the religious community been facing under Barack Obama? So, what he's referring to is what's called the Johnson Amendment, mm-hmm. which is the po- a component of the U.S. tax code. That means um, if you are a nonprofit, generally, and uh, a religious group specifically, if you endorse a candidate from the pulpit, you are at risk of losing your um, uh, tax exempt status as a nonprofit, yeah. right? So yeah. if you, so you, technically, you can be a faith group and be deeply political. You're just not going to be a nonprofit faith group. Um, and so the, you know, what what he's referring to is 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 repealing the Johnson Amendment to some degree or impacting it. He's, this is a campaign promise that's gone back for a while. So that's the threat he's talking about. Um, now the problem is in practice, th- this isn't really a thing that's all, it's enforced to begin with. So since 2008, uh, a very small percentage of uh, the religious right has been pushing for this to be repealed from the tax code. And they have this thing, uh, there's a litigation firm called the Alliance Defending Freedom that holds every year a thing called Pulpit Freedom Sunday, where anywhere from <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like 1,500 to 2,000 different uh, churches deliver a sermon in which they explicitly endorse a candidate or use explicitly political rhetoric, and then they record it, and then they mail it to the IRS <laughs> and dare them to do something about it. And that's about this Johnson Amendment, right? So here's the thing. Out of the (laughs) 2,000-plus churches that have participated in this, mostly conservative evangelical Christian churches, um, according to the Alliance Defending Freedom, just one has been audited by the IRS, and none of them have been punished. So this is already a thing that's only barely enforced to begin with. What? (laughs) What the hell? What are we? I mean, what? I mean, I will say this, though, and I don't want to give him too much credit, but Trump is Bushian in the way that he is pretty good at politics, the optics of it, mm-hmm. right? Like the policy stuff has clearly been a problem for him as, as he's finding out as more and more courts take a look at his executive orders. But like the optics of going up there and doing that for his religious voters is pretty good. And actually, to your point, one, clearly optics matters to Trump more than oh, yeah. most things. Oh, yeah. Um, but the other part of that is that, like, this is this idea of repealing the Johnson Amendment is actually really unpopular with every group of faith. Like, there was a 2016 PRI poll that said, um, that explicitly asked whether or not you should have more ex- uh, excessively political speech in a pulpit. And no major religious group in America supported it, including white evangelical Protestants. Even white evangelical Protestants were like, uh, uh, only a third supported this idea. Um, not, last month. Really? Not, yeah. Last month. Not, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not a popular idea. And huh. last month, 99 different religious groups, including entire denominations like the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America or the Presbyterian Church USA or the Episcopal Church, all signed on to a letter explicitly asking Congress not to repeal the Johnson Amendment and saying, you know, don't politicize our congregations. So this isn't actually a popular idea. Meanwhile, the executive order that Trump signed last week wasn't popular with conservatives either. He has the, you know, the, the, the uh, Heritage Foundation representatives said that it's, you know, um, it's woefully inadequate. The um, the Alliance Defending Freedom was hardly it said it was it left promises unfulfilled. And then we had um, uh, Dave French over the National Review said it's sorry. You mean President French? Remember? <laughs> remember, this was the savior for the Republican Party. Savior. President David President French. French. Yeah. OK, cool. I just want to make sure. And his candidate for the next election is The Rock. Yes, oh, of course. That's right. That's naturally. right. That's yeah. right. How high will he go? Um <laughs> <laughs> but even he was like, "This is this is worse than in, inadequate. Like this is that this that this is not an effective executive order because it doesn't do anything." However, this that might still not be the message that voters receive, right? Right. So right. you know, because right. if they see this as a giant op-ed with a bunch of evangelical leaders, 
Uh, is this one of those executive orders that it's going to find itself in the courts at some point, or it, was it even thorough enough to make it to that? So before this came out, um, because by the way, just to I don't mean to interrupt, but like just yeah. to give a little bit of background, like Trump has a, a sort of a habit now of doing these executive orders that don't actually do anything. Mm -hmm. They just sort of say like, I am sending this executive order to say that I intend to talk to this person about this. Right. And like they're showy and they're, they're like I said, it's, it's good for the politics, it's good for the optics, but they don't really actually do anything. So where does where does this fit in the executive order for the religious liberty? So uh, the, the thing about this EO is that it was it had all this build up because there was a, an alleged draft of it that leaked in February that was super expensive. Mm -hmm. It was going to get into if, it, if that draft had been the executive order, it was going to get into um, things called religious based refusals where you could deny service to someone if they were gay or if they supported abortion or if they'd had premarital sex. Like there was like these sweeping um, you know, things that were going to be given to religious groups to, to, to deny and to discriminate. So the ACLU and other groups like, you know, lawyered up. They were primed to sue as soon as this EO dropped. After the exa actual text of the executive order was signed, the ACLU was like, this isn't even worth suing over. So, <laughs> so they've, because it was all this buildup. And, right. and, and, it, and it, at the end of the day, it was an executive order that barely did anything. The one thing that, again, which is not something you could sue over, the one thing that folks do want to keep an eye on, though, is buried in this executive order is the idea that it gives um, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Uh-oh. The Jefferson Sessions. Jefferson Sessions. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, <laughs> if I, as it were. He, he now gets to be the person who provides guidance to the administration for what the definition of religious liberty means. So it doesn't mean he gets the full power, but he's the chief oh voice in the boy. room, according to this EO, for what religious liberty means for the Trump administration.